Hey, this is Sayyam Bhutani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science, a podcast for data science enthusiasts where I interview practitioners, researchers and cagglers about their journey, experience and talk all things about data science. Welcome to another episode of the Chai Time Data Science Show. I'm really excited to be interviewing one of my machine learning heroes for the second time on this episode, Kaggle Grandmaster and Senior Computer Vision Engineer at the Self-Driving Car Division of Lyft, Dr. Vladimir Iglovikov. Grandmaster has already been kind enough to share all of his secrets and his journey into machine learning slash data science in the amazing blog interview to which you can find a link in the description of the video or the podcast. In this interview, we talk about Albumentation's uh, framework, which is a, a framework by Alexander Buslaev, Alex Parinov, Evgene Kuchenya, and Dr. Vladimir Iglovikov. Albumentation is a fast image augmentation library that also serves as a wrapper around other libraries. In this episode, we talk all about image augmentations what makes the library great and the efforts, the research that went into the library. We also talk about open source and Grandmaster shares many great advices about working with open source. Make sure you check out the blog interview in the description and enjoy the conversation about albumentations. Hi everyone, today I'm honored to be joined by one of my machine learning heroes for the second time. Uh, I'm joined by Kaggle Grandmaster and Senior Computer Vision Engineer at the Self-Driving Car uh, Division of Lyft, Dr. Vladimir Iglo Vikov. We'll be talking about uh, one of his open source projects, the Albumentations Library. Um, thank you so much for joining me today, Grandmaster. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for giving this opportunity about talking about like our open source, I mean, library that we are doing in our free time. So it's a really good opportunity, like, I mean, to promote it, maybe explain more to the like audience and, you know, get more feedback and <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Sure thing. Um, so we all know you are one of the grandmasters for computer vision competitions. Um, but before we start talking about the framework and all things open source, could you maybe help us uh, set the stage for why image augmentations are important for Kaggle or maybe even computer vision tasks? Uh, so the main reason why image augmentations are important for like nearly any computer vision tasks because it helps. I mean, if it didn't help, there was no point. But like empirical <laughs> evidence shows that basically when you use image augmentations in the correct way, mm -hmm. it improves your model performance, generalization, and etc. So. The reason intuitively one may think about this, reason number one. So what is image augmentation? You basically take your original data and modify it in such a linear or maybe non-linear way. And it means what? You can think about this, that you think synthetically extending your data set. Mm -hmm. How much? If you take all your images and add a flipped horizontal version of this, you increase the data set twice. What about if you just like take this image and edit all images that like flip horizontally and vertically? And so it will be, you know, increased and both of these combinations four times. What about if you had like a bit of rotations here and there and this like, you know, makes bigger, bigger, bigger and bigger. And of course, like different transformations that can be like, so this is spatial that I just described, but one might go more creative, you know, play with pixel values, make it more blur and something, more modifications of this. And so what does it mean? It means that you can extend your data set. It, it becomes bigger. And as we know, especially in deep learning, bigger data set typically in most 99% of the cases, you're in increasing the size of your trained data set increases the accuracy of the model that's trained on this. Right. Uh, what we think about this is image augmentation is a regularization. Mm -hmm. We all know that there is like L1, L2, and some other types of regularization that help your model linear regression or deep learning or to be more generalizable and improve performance, all of them has one issue, you cannot interpret them. So L2, there is some value, you know, 
constrains your weights and so what I mean is it good bad like point one I don't know like cross validation will tell you okay. image validations on the other side they allow you to have some insights let's say you know you train some model and then you look at the train data set and there are plenty of blurry images you just okay mm-hmm. and you basically randomly try to blur images that you have and it may just ensure or may help to perform better on the blurry images then or maybe you see some images have some other properties and you basically can adjust your image augmentations based on the visual inspection and so basically you can use your brain your background everything that you learned so far to like improve. you said to create artificial data essentially yeah, but it's not just like enough, just artificial data. Because if I blindly try to improve my data set, it's huge. I can improve it in such a way that it will be attacking corner cases in my test data set and help with dealing with some. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And I assume like many people aren't aware that even data collection is, is quite a resource intensive task. So that's, that's one of the areas where this is definitely pretty important. I can tell give you this example. Last year, I believe I read two papers and probably within one week. So the people were talking about image net classification and they were comparing. So like in one paper, what did they do? They take, I believe it was auto augment. They trained mm-hmm. them as next one one for image net and they like tuned and chosen some Intel data augmentations in an intelligent way. And they got like top one accuracy, I believe like 84. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was another paper that also took similar network, like accuracy was 81. And then they took data set with noisy labels from, I don't remember where, but the size of the data set was 3.5 thousand bigger. Okay. It was like from 1 million, like, and it was became, you know, 3.5 billion or something like this. Wow. And they trained network on this bigger data set. And of course it took more time. And of course they needed to collect this to store to use more GPU power, and they also got the same 84%. So this is kind of one may think about this example. Mm-hmm. That kind of works. Uh, I want to emphasize, but that like second typically is probably preferred in industry, even it takes more GPU time and more collection. First one, you need to choose this data augmentation intelligently. And this requires mm-hmm. your like, it may be like not an art, art, craft, science. So you need some like person who's skilled in this to look into this. Second, yeah. on the other hand, you just blindly collect, train, good enough. So, I mean, both approaches are important, but if you're talking about specifically Kaggle competitions or basically talking about situations where data set are limited and you kind of like collect like 3,000 times more, mm-hmm. I mean, the augmentations, especially good one, is basically a way to go to beat your, you know, baseline in competition or maybe to beat baseline. And I'm pretty sure that like if one, and I hope one of the listeners may try to do it, Mm-hmm. You take existing image net classification or some other standard benchmark data sets and like add some data augmentations from our library, ones that are not like used there, you may be state of the art and you can publish paper and like get all like this <laughs> the things from this. Yeah. I'm sure many people would be interested. We will have all of these uh, links that we'll be talking about uh, linked off in the description. So please be sure to check those out. Um, now, uh, during a blog interview, uh, which is also linked in the description, you had said that you started Kaggle by, and you were sort of experimenting with all of, all of the experiments and you settled on computer vision, uh, which mm-hmm. I'm sure like the results we all are fans of. And I think during uh, this period, the library would have started to emerge. So could you tell us like, why did you feel the need to create, uh, start like working on this library? I mean, first of all, I want to say that like I'm only one of the authors of the library. Like I would like to say big thanks to Alexander Buslaev, Alex Parin- Parinov, Evgeny Kvitsheda, and they are, I would like to say, main contributors to the library. So in this sense, it would be very unwise and unfair to say that I am like an author, like and everything in the library. I'm one of the authors. We have slightly different skills. Probably I'm slightly strong on the, like we all like Kaggle masters, grandmasters. We all have like good top solutions, but I mean, we have slightly different complement and we all use this library in our like side projects at work. Mm-hmm. But I mean, still, yes. Yeah, so like all of us work in this and our joint worked helped us and led to this library. So I believe for, like why in general we started like how this library emerged. Early in the days when I started working on Kaggle, I implemented image augmentations like manually. And basically, I mean, it's it's really not a rocket science to write like a function that flips an image and p.flip and yeah, good enough. 
but and you do this issue appears when you work on image segmentation and in Kaggle for like a really long time there are like a lot of image segmentation right. competitions so you don't need just to flip an image you need to flip your mask at the mm -hmm. same time and you do this with some probability and I mean I got plenty of bugs there because sometimes you just forget to do it in sync and because just issues there and <laughs> similar story with crops similar story with rotations and you get a lot of like code which can lead to some mistakes and it still works like and so I, I also it. assume like back in the day like I think fast a now has all of these fancy options and uh, even PyTorch but back in the day I don't think these libraries supported so yeah, I'm talking about like station when it was probably like my first gold medal, ultra nerve sound segmentation, like my first like touch of the unit. Mm -hmm. And it was like three years ago, like a really long time, maybe like, or oh, maybe DSTL competition that happened like two years ago in spring. So mm -hmm. Torchmeet wasn't a thing at the time, Faster I didn't develop there and like many other libraries were not there. So like we were writing this code because we needed to. Okay. Then I mean, we looked around because the situation didn't look good and there was like image out library which is great and uh, great and was like a lot of a lot of things we learned and got from this library <laughs> and i believe again like two years ago there was a competition amazon from forest something about classification multi-label classification of the yeah. satellite images about amazon was hosted by at kaggle by planet labs mm -hmm. and what we got there it was classification so there were less issues about different you know things between masks and images but problem that we had because data set was relatively like small crops and we had a lot of GPU power. It was interesting competition. It was like Amnesty type competition. None of us wanted to do it. That's why we stuck for 180 networks. Okay. It was like the biggest like that we had like in sample. <laughs> yeah. not, used in, not used in production, but still we do it because I mean, it was easy to do. Just replace some backbone, something else. Mm -hmm. The issue we faced at that competition is that our GPU utilization was not even close to be 100%. Our CPU utilization, <laughs> our CPU utilization was at maximum. Okay, but our okay. CPU utilization was significantly lower. The reason for this is because two years ago, Image Look was extremely slow. It provided some nice functionality, like nice pipelines, but it was so slow. And as we know, I mean, if you want to iterate uh, to win competition or like do some kind of good project at work, you need to iterate fast. Fast iteration, you don't want. I mean, the GPU utilization to be a bottleneck. So, of course, like, I mean, first thing that we do, you replace HDD by SSD to like improve input output because we thought like it was an issue like originally. Mm -hmm. Then, I mean, we started looking into this like transformation, some profiling and we, we like figure out that some of them extremely slow. Because when, to... when you at this stage, you would want to like ounce out every juice from your hardware. So I think that, Abs that absolutely all people, all top cagglers, they're not just like into machine learning. They're probably typically like into decently the right code. And also they have like home, they're like dev boxes with multiple GPUs, some cooling, optimized hardware, overlocked CPUs, and et cetera, et cetera. Because you do, as you just mentioned, because it's your free time and it is your like compute power. You try to make everything as optimized as possible. Yep. And so to these augmentations and they were slow and we replaced them some became better mm -hmm. and now and also like as we know in competitions winners share their codes so someone shared here something shared there and like somehow different people were working on slightly similar like similar versions of some augmentations pipeline and then in like then came like few more competitions and then it was fall of 2000 what was 17, I believe, and was Carvana Challenge. And I merged in the same, I, I like it to Carvana Challenge where Alexander Bruslaev, I, and Artem Sinakov, we finished first, slightly mm -hmm. beating the feeding, which was like very entertaining. And <laughs> so there I got like, we got exposed to each other code about image augmentations, Alexander, I, and Artem, and like we realized that kind of, there is similar structure. Mm -hmm. And so again, the started to sort of connect for you then. Uh, we started thinking about this still, like, I mean, from practical performance, you're used to your pipeline, you know how to optimize it, you know how to make it better. Yeah. And you kind of improve on top of this. And with every new competition, our image imitation pipeline for every of us became better. Mm -hmm. Somewhere, I know, like going one after another, Alexander's pipeline was the most developed. He invested the most in this. And I would say, yeah, like, so image alb albumitation, so image augmentation library that we have right now, Yep. It is mostly based on his vision of how image augmentation should be and prototypes of the code, like, and even like structure 
so it's like that's why you know if you want to think who is the main like author and computer contributor of the like albumitations library it's alexander buslaev who is computer vision engineer he works in mapbox in minsk and belarus right now so yeah and then alexander also participated once um urban 3d some space net challenges and then with salim seferbekov and victor durnov they won data science ball in 2018 and at that point we probably like discussed and decided it's time basically maybe to release it <laughs> and so yeah like i mean alexander is usually like you know refused to release he said it's not perfect like i mean we like think about us badly and like i mean it just doesn't really matter let's like release what we want <laughs> because yeah. as, as i know after many kaggle competitions i release a code and it's badly written it's unclear what to do spaghetti code still it's useful for someone and of course on top of this you can iterate collect feedback and make it a better product so yeah. somewhere about a year ago cvpr of the last year we released mm-hmm. Code. It was very buggy, dirty, worked for us, supported only classification and segmentation mm-hmm. tasks, but it was still already a lot, especially because it was based on, you know, so many Kaggle competitions, pet projects and other things that we're doing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, now, I also want to like uh, talk about the breadth of transforms that are supported by the library. So it supports uh, quite a few augmentations that I don't think other libraries support. So, uh, could you uh, maybe highlight on that? Uh, this is good. So, in some sense, this is one of the issues that we like have this library. We know how to use it. We know what functionality it has. But our documentation and probably like promotion examples of Jupyter notebooks less developed than it should be. That's <laughs> why for many people it's even like really unclear what functionality do we have and what like differs our library from others. Mm-hmm. First of all, I mean, let's talk about what are the what are the similarities, what are the differences. Okay. Uh, similarities. First of all, like image augmentation, they change. And if you talk about image aug, that influenced our library a lot. Two years ago, it was a completely different story right now. Right now, it's much faster, more functionality. And guys that work on this, I have great respect to them. Mm-hmm. They do a good job. Uh, so, but still, like, what is our, like, kind of maybe selling points, if you want, why we developed it? As I mentioned, I know we didn't like speed of these image imitation libraries. Mm-hmm. And so in our library, what we do, we just look around, we see what transformations work faster in what implementation, because it can be NumPy, it can be OpenCV, or it yeah. can be this interesting thing for images that are in like 8-bit images, it can be open CV to do some kind of transformation, but for, mm-hmm. you know, or maybe it's higher bits images and higher bit, like 11-bit or 16-bit per pixel you can find in satellite imagery, it's typically standard there. I, I mean, you I imagine this, like this uh, you, you would have like gained the knowledge through all of, all of this Kaggle experience and all your other uh, experience from the other projects that you've been working on. Uh, so uh, in some sense, yes, but like probably not. So in terms of comparing benchmarks, I mean, for many of these transformations, we had like some kind of implementation, let's say using OpenCV, and then someone tells or like mentions that like, num- oh, we got the idea, like let's ship, like, you know, flip in NumPy, OpenCV is mm-hmm. faster. Then you do profiling, benchmark, and then you see that in this case, yeah, this, in this case, no. And <laughs> basically that's what we implemented in our code, trying to make it as fast as possible because we want to avoid this situation as it was in this Amazon challenge where CPU is a bottleneck. And mm-hmm. right now GPUs like become bigger, faster, as mm-hmm. CPUs don't grow as fast. And yeah. that's why, yeah, we would like to ensure this. So first is the speed. For most of the transformations that we have, like, I mean, we are faster. Of course, like situation is changing, image out gets better, Keras is still slow, Torch Vision gets better here and there, but still kind of slow. Mm-hmm. Salt gets better. So, and in our repo, if you want to compare what and how, we do have a bench in our, and we ha- in our repository, we have a code to do benchmark on your hardware across different libraries. Mm-hmm. And we also in our readme have a table that like compares and shows what's the situation with respect to our latest measurements and latest that we got, like we did, it was about a month ago. So first the speed. Second okay. one is about like IPIs. So when I was writing this image augmentations early in the days, it was some really like for loops calling functions here and there. Mm-hmm. Right now, augmentations support this functionality. You basically like, you know, get a list of the transformations that you want to use, their parameters, something random, something non-random, with what probabilities to use it. And mm-hmm. it's the one line per transformations. Transformations can be pretty advanced, can be some spatial like flips, rotations, transpositions or crops, 
or it may be something like color transform, HCV, RGB space, or it can be some weird one like HPEG compression and we use it for some forensic challenges and basically something else. So, and you can do it one transformation panel line. And of course, we also have this functionality when in this pipeline of transformations, you can choose one or another with some probabilities. It's really convenient. You want 10 transformations, and this is pretty advanced because typically for image net classification or some other tasks, they have three, you know, like crop, precise, and <laughs> a bit of color transformation, and that's it. Yeah. So it allows you to go really, really advanced. And this basically helps a lot in computer vision competitions. Okay. Again, I want to mention that in the last eight months, to my knowledge, all top, all, all like top solutions to Kaggle computer vision challenges used our library. Well, so okay. this, I mean, we should probably add this documentation and extend this, but it is the case. So, I mean, it, mm -hmm. and one of the reasons, because instead of three like small transformations, people can throw 20, 30 and do some kind of really weird stuff. So mm -hmm. second, yes, it's like IPI that makes it very convenient. Third mm -hmm. one. Third one we added recently, and that's why I'll mention it now. So for reproducible research, often you want to know what happened and how. So how yep. my current machine learning pipeline work, I have some kind of standard pipeline and everything that can be defined like outside, let's say learning rate, type of the optimizer, momentum for the optimizer, augmentation, some parameters of the network, something else. It okay. is the outside like config. Mm -hmm. And before this, like when you use YAML or JSON config, it was tricky to define this, our augmentations there because like they were defined as a Python code. Yeah. But in the release, we added serialization, deserialization. So right now to do reproducible research, basically here's my config, here's my result. And mm -hmm. this includes like parameters, networks and augmentations. Got it. It's possible. And this is more closer, probably a bit away from the competitions and closer to production environment again. Mm -hmm. This is a really cool, important feature. I'm not sure that any other libraries do this. Next, I think feature. not many people even like talk about it, and it's uh, I assume like very central, not just to production, but even like experimentation or research. Even so, I don't think many people even talk so about this. That. Is true. Reproducible research. I mean, people like don't talk about this as much as about we are beating human performance here and there. <laughs> but this area is growing, and what I see in CVPR enables like people discuss this, and they like some papers related to this reproducible research. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it comes mostly. I mean, academia doesn't care about this as much, and as we know, most of the papers you can't reproduce. Mm -hmm. But in industry, it is a bottleneck. And I believe Andre Karpathy talked in his talk about Tesla and, re and how they like deal with this deep learning and how they reproduce their yeah. networks. And there was something about this there. So, mm -hmm. and at the same time, you would like to do some kind of transformation, augmentations defined in Python code, then you want to dump into like Python dictionary or JSON config or YAML and mm -hmm. save it and commit as a code somewhere or maybe. So for this, like, you also have this functionality. So, and Alex Parin have added this and this is really cool. I mean, I use it a lot, especially these days when I became much more responsible to like reproducibility and code that I'm writing. Yeah. This one, third one. So we got like, I mean, in terms of computer vision tasks, we support classification type of the task when only image is like affected. We support segmentation task when both like in similar regime image and mask are affected. We support bounding boxes again for detection tasks when you have image and bounding box like affect in the same way like crops or transformations rotations whatever it is mm -hmm. so again classification segmentation detection tasks we support key points for like many transformations which allows us these key points is like big thing right now especially because research moved from academia to a more production environment yeah so we support this and we also can do it at the same time for example if you're for some image you have segmentation mask, bounding boxes, key points, mm -hmm. whatever it is. And then let's say you want to crop some part of this. Mm -hmm. it, it is automatically cropped same area in the image, same in the mask, same in the bounding boxes, same in the key points. And so if you're talking about instant segmentation or some interesting tasks that involve, you know, multiple outputs of different types, it everything is done simultaneously. Because here making like, you know, doing bugs or doing some mistakes is extremely easy and our library allowed to do it out of the box. So this type of the task. What else can we do? This is interesting cool functionality. Again, I didn't see in any other library. Multiple input, multiple output. Let's say, I believe right now there is some Kaggle competition where you have like two eyes and you need to do some kind of classification or regression at the end. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And let's say you would like to do similar transformation to this, like to images, and randomly choose like flips, rotations, some color transformations, but okay. transformation would be exactly the same to the both images. Got yeah. It. Okay. Our library allows it out of the box. You can have like, you know, multiple input images. I mean, from one to, I mean, as much run of your computer has and apply this. Or you know, the use case, if you have a video and you want to crop some part of this or color it or do some kind of different transformations, out of the box, I mean, you can basically apply to videos to sequence of frames. That's super interesting for sure. So this allows this because again, like instant you start writing code for this, there will be bugs. It's one thing, mm -hmm. multiple inputs. At the same time, you can do similar story for multiple outputs. Let's say you have like few segmentation masks, few bounding boxes, few key points. And again, you would like to do similar like crop or rotate or transpose or some other transformation for each of them at the same time. So input images, one or many of them, and also output like masks mm -hmm. or, tar or multiple targets. It, it happens out of the box, like with all of them simultaneously. And this is again, very convenient, especially because people start talking about like multiple outputs, different targets. And mm -hmm. again, so you do it works out of the box. Okay. I strongly believe for everyone who's working in academia or maybe competitions for some type of the tasks to try our library because you get like huge competitive advantage over people that just don't do it because I mean, mm -hmm people will be lazy to implement this and you get this out of the box with a few lines of the code, but this is really cool. So, and I believe these are the main things that we have right now. And this like last few that I described makes a difference. So serialization, multiple targets, mm, that probably that's it, yeah, So I think even in, as per my knowledge, uh, like image, standard image augmentations are sort of the standard, but when you start talking about segmentation and like bounding boxes not many people are even talking about it let alone like talking about augmenting data there so i think that's also an exclusive zone for augmentations yeah definitely ah one thing i want to add in the latest release we added lambda transform it also exists in image maybe in some other libraries what is lambda transform so if you have some function that came into your mind to get to your paper and it's not implemented in augmentations mm -hmm. If you have this function, you basically can make it part of your image transformation pipeline and okay. transform the image in like interesting way. I, don't, I mean, whatever. Just like a Lambda function. Uh, just Python. Lambda function Python, you can also make it part of the Lambda transform we have. So this is also okay. cool. So there is also some transformation in some other library that you would mm -hmm. like to be part of our pipeline with all this like synchronization, everything like this. Just wrap it with Lambda and this documentation done. So this like, Probably not. So yeah, definitely helps. I'm sure that's, uh, that's everyone would love to check it out. And that's definitely super interesting. But I'm also curious, like, since it's, uh, I think four of you working on the library, could you share maybe what kind of experimentation and research goes into like continuation? Uh, con because you continuously adding features and also developing the library. Okay, so how much time do we spend on this? Not too much, because we do it in the full time, because we have like someone has competitions, someone has work, someone has other projects. Yeah. And because it's in more or less stable phase that we like kind of like good enough to use. Okay. Time that we invested in this is not that big. At the same time, if we like see some interesting information or community requests, it will definitely do this. The biggest driving force for us right now is the community. And again, like if you're asking how can you help our library, the biggest, I mean, impact and help that you can do, your feedback. If you found a bug, submit an issue, like request mm -hmm. bug report and our like GitHub repo. If you like have issues using it in terms of documentation, just basically, you know, something that can be obvious to us, maybe not obvious to you, mm -hmm. submit it, should we extend documentation, or like pull request will be even better. And again, some, any type of the feedback, that's what you want. If people submit feedback, like, wow, this is interesting feature. Let's say we don't use key points, but people requested this and we did this. Serialization, we needed this, that's why we added this. So mm -hmm. two like sources, if you want something for our like work, pet project competitions, and it may happen that we do, we'll just basically add this. Okay. But, and it's like one source, but right now it looks like we are more or less in a good shape. Second one, feedback from the users, their requests, like what to add, how to do it. And again, so this is our like second driving force. How much time, hard to tell. Maybe we can do it more, but because it's open source project that everyone can like fork and use for their purposes. And because we're not paying money for this, yeah. just 
no free time got it um so we all know like that kagles do love sharing but uh, i want to ask you like why not keep the secret sauce to yourself like stay the exclusive grandmaster and not like make this open source why create this as an open source project instead ah uh, so i don't think that secret sauce business would work here so let's say one of the things that i used to like compete well in kaggle competitions let's say i work hard some competition and then it's i'm full of ideas then experiment iterate try check them and at some point i get to the plateau i'm out of ideas or nothing works and let's say i'm place 15 and i would like to get hired what do i do i share my code i share my ideas at the forum i am basically share everything with the community because why because instantly like this like hundreds of people jump on it because they want to get to the 15th 50th yeah. place i they use their creativity their ideas and they give me new ideas so and i use their insights of course they get higher than me but i also like use their knowledge to like refresh my brain and to get higher on top of this works for me. so it's like probably one of the motivations so i don't believe in the secret sauce that much <laughs> have something because if you look at the kaggle if you look at the academic paper people try to there to do some clear study and some clear experimentation to say the bit like invented this type of delay or this augmentation so this like trick uh, optimizer mm-hmm. and we got some boost kaggle okay. competitions they different they're significantly less transparent if you look at the like solutions of the winners those 40 different ideas yeah. which of them more impactful less impactful it's really unclear that's why there's no one secret sauce there's secret mm-hmm. soup of a bunch of different sources <laughs> and just saving this in house will not work and as a, and again so augmentation gives you a boost but it's not a like life and that you can implement these things yourself mm-hmm. other implementation libraries have similar functionality maybe better but maybe worse mm-hmm. basically it may be helpful but yeah <laughs> and of course third one i mean if the only thing that i win kaggle competitions is using this image augmentation libraries i kind of suck i have <laughs> failed myself in terms of new ideas papers research creativity and this is one of like 50 things that ha- that are helpful so got it and okay. last one i like to share with the community i share my knowledge in a blog post i share my knowledge in papers i share this like podcast interview and again thank you for inviting me if, like for this opportunity <laughs> I mean I feel good when people that when I help people and I try as much as possible and this is also one of the reasons why we did this to help the community to advance the research to help kagglers and it's also pretty fun I'm sure all of the people not just from kaggle not just from academia even from industry are grateful that you always share your knowledge so Uh, our library is, is definitely used in some big companies i will not tell you which one because they okay. can share this i just know because my friends work there and they told me about like other teams so their teams using it but definitely it got absorbed not only in kaggle like some pet projects some pretty oh. big projects use it in their pipelines that that's great to know i think that's that in itself speaks for the library so uh, that brings me to the point like could you tell us a uh, few things of the framework that you really proud of things that uh, you put out over the past year you see there are like few things here like that i would like to talk about first one functionality was i'm really like happy that we added this serialization deserialization because it, it's like important step like for industrial ab- adoption and overall for like reproducible research and removing duplicated work within a community so this probably like my favorite at the same time this multi target thing that like does multi target multi image thing that like again allows yeah. limitations to such a tasks where this image limitations are not typically used mm-hmm. this is a typical thing but this is a technical one what i also would like to talk about so for me and for other folks like for us this image augmentation library is not just like you release a source code as you may know there are a, i mean enormous amount of like good code good like some libraries at the github that like i mean has like 50 stars or less and no one know that they exist yeah. and so code is written and it's good can solve some problems no one knows about this and nothing can be done about this mm-hmm. we need a lot of like we don't think about our library only as about just like some library some source code some purely from the software engineering perspective Mm-hmm. think partially about this library is about a product this library is good but again if no one know that it exists it's not cool if people don't <laughs> give 
spec, it's also not cool. And mm -hmm. so we will work in maybe not hard enough, but you work on some kind of user adoption. We would like to like uh, to give big thanks to open data science community, or as the I probably like many of you know this from the Kaggle competition. We have discussions there, people give us feedback and many mm -hmm. new features and bugs were implemented based on the work of the people from there. Right. Uh, so also like Kaggle community gave some feedback. I like support, you know, like even like some tweets about our like releases were repeated by Kaggle and even like CEO of the Kaggle that like helped like user adoption promote this library. Mm -hmm. you know, we wrote some paper, we present this at different like conferences and meetups. And right now I believe we have like 2,600 stars at the GitHub. I mean, all my like other projects have significantly less. I'm not sure this number is big, but I mean, still bigger than many things that I know. So like third thing that I would like to be proud about, work that our team had about promotion and yes, mm -hmm. just boosting user adoption and helping other people just like to know, to use, to adapt. Got and it. yeah. Okay. And uh, if you could maybe like, uh, I know there's already like plenty of stuff in there, but maybe some future feature that you're excited about and you're looking forward to? This is a good question. Let's think about this. So right now, as I've said, this library satisfies our needs. It works really well. So requests like that we got right now on the issue tracker, they are like either some like small bugs that we are fixing like pretty fast. Um, questions about documentations, and this is important for us. We need to extend it and have more examples. Mm -hmm. But fact that documentations were added to the Kaggle kernels, probably like, I mean, we assume and we hope that Kaggle community will help us to promote implementations and show examples of its usage in advanced cases like in the kernels. Mm -hmm. So documentation is like a big thing for us, maybe not this exciting, but kind of mandatory. One thing that can be interesting is right now there is like some work about style transfer for image augmentations when basically people, you know, using GANs and people do some kind of, you have that, uh, daytime image and then they do the style transfer, you get same image, but at night, and mm -hmm. this used for, but still objects are the same. So it can like be treated as image augmentations. And there's some work about this. We will, it requires some neural networks here and there, some guns, and it's still mm -hmm. not really clear how to make it part of the pipeline. Mm -hmm. But we believe that it can be pretty like good step in this direction. Another feature. So we have this image augmentation library. We have a lot of transformations, mm -hmm. but one of the, differences between experienced deep learner and probably like less experienced is the intuition and experience just in terms of choosing what transformations to use and what mm -hmm. parameters to choose because this is not structured well yep. we are going so right now Evgeny Nishbitsky who is also Kaggle master he created like a website albumentations.ml I believe where you can upload an image and try different transformations like parameters visualize how well does it look and based on this Right in the website itself? Uh, we didn't give a link, just probably we'll add this to the, you know, comments to okay. podcast. I'll give you a link. So, sure. I mean, so, but we need to scale it up. There's a lot of transformations and it's, it's still very unclear what parameters to choose, what transformation to choose. What do I and other folks typically do? You take a few images, you apply different transformations, play with this for an hour, like some Jupyter notebooks, some experiments, and then what makes sense, you add to your pipeline, but this is manual and inefficient and not very scalable. We are going to make some kind of websites, more automated tool following Evgeny's example in this web, in this like, you know, tool to just basically to help to choose what transformation to do, how does it look? Because some transformations, they transform image in a very like strange way that you just don't even expect. So yeah. this issue can be solved. And yes, so we expect this Again, like, so it's not like incremental change. It's something that should open doors to my aggressive use in many pipelines. So probably these are our nearest plans. Mm -hmm. We will see what will come here and there because as I've said, it's our, you know, free time and current <laughs> library is more or less working. But yeah, like if someone will want to participate to create like issues, feature requests, mm -hmm. proposals, give feedback about documentation, all which is again better to do pull requests and do some work so that I mean, to become a contributor, it's highly appreciated. Okay. Um, I also want to talk about the setup for the framework and its extensibility. So could you tell us like what libraries is it based upon? I'm sure it's multiple numbers, maybe it's like the majority ones and uh, what all frameworks are currently supported by albumentations? 
what it is based on. So as I've said, for every transformation, we are looking what is the fastest way to do it. So of course, I mean, some transformations are done better with purely NumPy. So like NumPy is part of it. Of course, OpenCV is highly optimized. And for many of them, like for most of them, I would say OpenCV is used. Mm -hmm. We also, there are some transformations in image uh, that looked very interesting and we didn't want to implement it. That's why we had the wrappers on top of them. Mm -hmm. So probably these are like, and maybe something else. And again, it may happen that tomorrow someone will create pull request with some library that's also used inside of this. Mm -hmm. And here I want to mention that again, if you, because of this Lambda transform, many transformations, you can like add pill functionality and many other libraries like here. Okay. So in terms of like, that's what it is based on. What is fastest is used. So just it's pure from the like speed perspective. Okay. What frameworks are supported? Mm -hmm. Main framework for deep learning for us right now, it's probably PyTorch. Mm -hmm. Learn that we use Keras and Cafe and something else. Mm -hmm. So when we developed this augmentations library, our main focus was PyTorch. Okay. So PyTorch definitely supported. Mm -hmm. uh, what about other like libraries? So in this augmentations library, what do we think about images and masks is just like NumPy arrays. So if your image and your like loading pipeline and your data loader can be, it can be implemented as an NumPy array, mm -hmm. good enough, we don't care, just like use them, that's it. Gotcha. So and it automatically means that like if you're using Keras and again, like there's a lot of examples in the internet on how to use augmentation with Keras, I mean, go ahead. TensorFlow is slightly trickier. It works on Tensor mm, on some kind of like TF records and some <laughs> other things here and there. We never checked how it can be used there, but if someone will find a way, it will be again highly appreciated. It will extend documentation with this functionality. So for now, I would like to say PyTorch and Keras definitely supported everything else. If you will be able to implement your images and masks as NumPy arrays during data loading pipeline, I mean, good enough, like we'll go with this. Got it. Um, so the library, uh, I was going to the uh, GitHub page and the library boasts top results at Kaggle, top coder, CVPR, MICC AI. So do you think like if Kagglers uh, start to include albumentations in their pipeline even more, uh, they can start bagging medals, maybe like move from bronze to silver, from silver to gold? For sure, if they do it in the correct way, like, I mean, it's <laughs> definitely will give them a boost. Again, I mean, there is no guarantee the fuels augmentations, it will like help you a lot. But as I mentioned, first of all, like all winner solutions in the last eight months and Kaggle computer vision competitions used augmentations, maybe not all, but most of them, mm -hmm. based on my discussion with the folks. And second, I mean, I also believe like due to this functionality that we developed and this like simple API that allows you to do pretty crazy stuff in a few lines, I mean, it will speed your iterations up so that you'll be able to focus more on some creative ideas rather than some mundane work on debugging transformations. And again, like we have extensive set of different transformations, which means that you can like experiment and apply them randomly. Yeah. And yes, basically to your question, if you're in the bronze and you switch from other like image augmentation library to you know, augmentations, there are chances, I will not guarantee you, but it may happen that it will just purely this step and using it in a more aggressive way, we will move you higher on the leaderboard. Mm -hmm. It's also like, as, as we call deep learning is alchemy. So if you like mix all chemicals, it might explode, but mix in the right way and you get the right result. Uh, yeah, and again, like, you know, right way and you should do it fast again. And I spend a lot of time on debugging my image, like transformations pipelines early in the days. Mm -hmm. And right now, the fact that I don't need to sp spend my time on this is great. So I hope mm -hmm. others can also benefit from our work. Okay. Um, now, I know this might sound intimidating to beginners. So uh, what kind of expertise would you imagine would be required to, you know, get started with this? Like, uh, I know there are example codes. Can one pick those up uh, right and get started right away? Uh, we hope so. So we created examples for like, you know, how to transform only images, images and masks, multiple transforms, some segmentation, like, so I hope you'll be like, people will be able to pick like from these examples. Again, if something is not clear and most likely it may happen, I really encourage everyone, beginners, non-beginners, give us feedback, write something in the issues. And basically it will add us because, I mean, we know how to use it. We understand the code. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, documentation may be not that good, well written and Jupyter notebooks that we wrote may be like, not misleading, but we can skip important steps. Basically, give us feedback and if something's not clear, we'll extend it. Another yeah. thing, 
yeah, but again, I encourage you to look through these notebooks before, like, you know, asking mm-hmm. questions. Maybe we answered some questions there. Mm-hmm. Okay. But so it should be yeah, applying. Yeah. It should be like few lines of the code for like pretty crazy stuff. Basically, do your homework, but uh, the creators are always there to help. help out. Exactly, and not like like we're eager to like we are looking for like your feedback, how to improve the product and how to make it better. So I, I think. Really like many people would definitely appreciate this because we i don't want to name any frameworks but we have these huge fam- frameworks that are sort of open source but creators are not that inclined towards feature requests or even like issues i mean i don't judge them that much like <laughs> working open source framework is tricky if it's like small i mean if it's small and like you know like kind of on the like stable face as ours right now supporting is not rocket science i mean you get some requests here and there but it's not that bad. At the same time, if you're probably like, oh, maybe another thing that I would like to mention, and here I would like to say big thanks to Alex Parinov, who invested a lot into like architecture and like, you know, automatic documentation generating and making mm-hmm. everything automatic. This saves a lot of time to us. If it was like much less, the quality of the code was much worse, we'd had like more bugs, support will be more painful and we mm-hmm. like, you know, be like more stressed out. <laughs> but because like good code and like we a good like page support is the uh, support is not that hard. At the same time, a framework is bigger, maybe like slightly well, less written, and there is a lot of feedback from the users on the everyday basis about bugs, feature requests. Mm-hmm. Supporting will be painful, and because you have your life, because you have your like main job, because you have some other activities, you may be less responsive to this request. Yeah. Okay. Um, I am like everyone very thankful to you and all the creators for this framework. So uh, I also wanted to ask like, how could we, how, how can we support the framework uh, if you want to, for those who are interested? I believe I said this already a few times, but first of all, <laughs> most important feedback, give us feedback. What do you want? What doesn't work for you? Like issues. So like, you know, if you're a member of ODS.ai, there are like special like channels, Slack like channel there, we can like give like future request feedback and some other questions. Mm-hmm. It's one thing. Again, if you would be like happy to participate and maybe like, you know, and we mentioned in every hour release, we like mentioned people that participated and contributed. And again, maybe you'll be able to sell it for like your like line and resume, contributed to albumentations. I mean, we would be happy. Like we add everyone who's like, you know, like doing smallest requests, like everyone is added. So if you would like to improve functionality, I mean, add new transformations or something else, improve documentation, like create pull requests, like, I mean, have it, like appreciate it. So this is like second, like feedback. And third, and of course, like, just like try to use it. Okay. I mean, the most important, I mean, just try to use it for your projects. It may help you, may help us, but probably, probably that's it. I mean, we're doing this in our free time. So like, we don't need any money support. Mm-hmm. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so before we conclude, uh, I know you said many great advices in your uh, uh, blog style interview, which I encourage everyone to go check out after this interview. It has a lot of advice in there. But uh, I also want to ask you, like, uh, for our beginners who are intimidated to like contribute to open source, uh, since you mentioned that as in your earlier interview, that as you participated in competitions, your repositories grew. So what would be your best advice to like how to get used to that intimidation and uh, B would be like, do you welcome beginner contributions to albumentations as well? Uh, this is a good question. Like, so on one side, we're definitely like welcome. Uh, on the other side, if it's like really like bad, it <laughs> may take time to give feedback and work with this person through this code, like, and to like get this to the appropriate quality, it may take much longer time than doing it yourself. Mm-hmm. Still, 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 even if you're a beginner and you create pull requests, like do it as you can. We work with you. It will help you to get like better code quality and like, you know, to the code practices that we are using in our like library. And also, I mean, it will give us motivation to like address this issue and to improve and yeah, to do stuff yeah. with this. So if you intimidate it, just do it. I mean, I will not guarantee that it will like, you know, work, but like probably you'll learn something, library will get better. And so just like do this. And maybe a general advice for people who want to contribute to open source, but like even like it's it's sort of like Kaggle, you have all these experienced people, but you feel intimidated by that sometimes. Don't feel intimidated. I mean, 
<laughs> okay, what happens? Like, I mean, so I like, I mean, so what happens? You have some library. There are like some people that work on this library. You never met them before. They'll never met you. You don't even know each other's real names. What's yeah. the worst case scenario will happen if you will try to contribute, but you'll get rejected or something else will just, you know, not work. Then nothing. I mean, you'll get upset for a bit, although you, you as an adult, you should get used to the rejection <laughs> for like different reasons. Just do it. Really not a big deal. Okay. Yeah. It's similar like with the Kaggle. You know, many people like, you know, intimidated by Kaggle, how to start it. I mean, just do it. I mean, because like, they're like, yeah. Many people that do it. So you're not like dumb or <laughs> most of them. Just do you can do you like impact and it should I work. I think Grandmaster CPMP had given one uh, sort of advice here that use a, uh, an alias if, if you if you like worried. So I think that's also useful in that this case as well. Uh, I mean, hard for me to imagine. I mean, I'm pretty arrogant. That's why I like put my name everywhere. It doesn't really bother me that much. But yeah, I kind of like this advice. It's definitely like a way to overcome some intimidation. Just you can be behind some anonymous alias. Mm -hmm. And, you know, realistically, like, you can start with anonymous alias because you're intimidated. But later on, it can become a brand when yep. you get more experience. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, all right. Thanks for all the great advices and for the answers. And uh, for doing the second interview and also thanks to you and all the creators for uh, albumentations. Thank you for taking this interview. I hope like this interview will, will help other people to like start using our library. I mean, it definitely makes every person who's using our library makes us feel that like we spend this time just for some reason and we <laughs> made the world slightly more interesting and speeded up research and things like this. And also, I mean, if, ah, another thing that I forget, like, you know, if you want to say thank you, just say thank you. If you, like, take any of these authors and, I mean, probably writing, like, thank you in the issue request, not a good idea, <laughs> but, like, in some Twitter or, like, LinkedIn or mm -hmm. somewhere else, so just, like, just say thank you for the library, it would make us feel good. Got it. All right. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.